In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Amen. so we are on the, in the Green Book, we're on 293. 279. And 279 is the round book. Bottom, bottom of 279. I thought it was the first name of 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 the first Underneath the three stars, it says, when a person feels his heart overflowing with love for Christ, he feels the necessity of communing and being united with love. So now we're at the moment of communion. So that's what he's talking about here. The moment when a person receives the word into himself is the moment of divine love, which is offered, and of human love, which draws near to receive the offering. Christ's holy body and blood are eternal love. St. Ignatius says, I desire the bread of God, and for my drink I desire his blood, which is love and corrupted. Christ was not content to become man, to be buffeted and killed, but he also commingles himself with us. He changes us into his own body, not only in faith, but in reality. Christ desires to come into our hearts by means of this mystery. O oh, love, truly divine and inexorable, where should, or I should rather call you flames of love rising up to heaven. <laughs> The Holy Fathers urge us to respond to this divine love. Dedicate yourself entirely to God by means of this mystery, receiving with love that beloved Jesus, who out of his exceeding love ordained such a beloved sacrament that a heavenly and covetable union should take place between God who loves and you who are loved. We show our love and gratitude to our benefactor and are inundated with new gifts. We are already tasting the heavenly kingdom. Let us love Christ as we should love him. This love of ours for him is itself the great reward which God gives us. This is the kingdom and sweet pleasure. This is enjoyment, glory, and honor. This is light. This is the great happiness which words cannot describe or mind conceive. The love of God is paradise. When we find love, we are nourished on heavenly bread. One who has found love eats Christ every day and every hour, and from this becomes immortal. Blessed is he who eats the bread of love, which is Jesus. Love is the kingdom which the Lord promised to his disciples in a veiled manner, saying that they would eat in his kingdom. So what is it that says they will eat and drink at the table of his kingdom, if not love? For love is able to nourish man in place of food and drink. Love is the wine that makes glad the heart of man, and he is blessed who has drunk of that wine. The divine liturgy is the kingdom of God that we are waiting for in the future. And the food at the supper of the kingdom is love. Through repentance and fear of God, we traverse the sea of this life and arrive at love. Repentance is the ship. Fear is its helmsman. And love is the divine harbor. So remember, it's, we're talking about with the fear of God, faith, and love draw near. So fear places us in the ship of repentance, conveys us across the sullied sea of life, and brings us to the divine harbor, which is love, to which all those who are weary and heavy laden attain through repentance. Once we arrive at love, we have arrived at God. <laughs> the priest gives communion to the people, saying to each communicant, the servant of God is granted communion in the precious and all-holy body and blood of our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life. While communion is being given, the choir chants the following tropion of your mystical supper, Son of God, receive me today as a communion. For I will not tell the mystery to your enemies. I will not give you a kiss like Judas, but like the thief, I confess you. Remember me, Lord, in your kingdom. As the celebrant gives the holy body and blood of the Lord to each person, he addresses him or her by name, by the name given them when they were baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and became sons of God by grace. <laughs> holy communion marks the moment of our personal encounter with the Lord. Through the lips of the celebrant, Christ the Good Shepherd calls his sheep one by one. He calls his sheep by name. The faithful approach him and receive him from and receive from his most pure hands the food that gives in corruption. When you see the priest giving you the holy mysteries, do not think that it is the priest doing this. Rather believe that the hand stretched out is that of Christ. Christ is not only the shepherd, but also the door of the sheep, the true gateway to life. And through him the sheep go in and out and find food which again is Christ himself. What shepherd feeds his sheep on members of his own body? And why do I say shepherd? There are many mothers who, after the pains of childbirth, hand their children over to wet nurses. Yet Christ cannot endure to do that, but himself nourishes us with his own blood and in every way intertwines us with himself. 
through the holy mysteries, that is, his body and blood, he mingles himself with each believer, and those he has begotten in baptism he feeds with his own self, not handing them over to anyone else. We take him in. Body and blood of God, and all, all together. Why is it with fear of God? Yeah, faith and blood yeah. draw near. Yeah, God's faith and love. Yeah, right. It's not just Because in ancient Greek, phobo, phobos, which means yeah. fear, it meant also <clears throat> respect. So it didn't mean just fear like we mean it. So, like in the scriptures that we read, uh, in the epistle that we read, I think it's Ephesians for um, the marriage ceremony. It said the last line of it says, and the woman shall fovate, the, the husband. And so some old translations translated the woman should fear the husband. But but that's not really what the Greek means. It means respect. Respect. Uh, we were always taught, not me for this, that don't be afraid. Be, a, how it is, be afraid that you're not worthy. Yeah. And go with respect mm -hmm. and humble and be you know, respectful yeah. and ask for forgiveness as you approach the chalice. Yeah, that's a good rule. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. If the divine liturgy in its totality is the ocean of God's grace and love, if throughout the liturgy we are receiving the gifts of grace, then at the moment of Holy Communion we receive the very giver of these gifts, Christ himself. In truth, we are not partaking of one of his gifts, but of his very self. Through Holy Communion, we become one body with Christ. You take into you the Lord Himself. You are mingled with His holy body. You are intermixed with the blood that is with the body that is in heaven, says Saint John Chrysostom. The all pure blood of the Master is mingled with our blood and transforms our souls. It makes our souls vigorous and pure and leads them to the infinite beauty of the divine archetype. We humans were created in God's image, and this blood vivifies the royal image in us. This blood produces an indescribable beauty and does not allow the nobility of the soul to wither because it is constantly watering and nourishing it. This blood is the salvation of our souls. By this, the soul is washed and made beautiful. By this, it is enkindled. It causes our intellect, our noose, to shine more brightly than fire and our soul to glitter more than gold. <clears throat> when Christ comes into us, he does not sanctify our soul alone, but our whole being. For by Holy Communion, body is mingled with body, blood with blood. What great mysteries are these? What a miracle that the mind of Christ mm -hmm. should become one with our mind, that his will should be amalgamated with our will, his body with our body, his blood with our blood. What is our mind like when the divine mind prevails over it? What is our will like when the divine will predominates? What becomes of the dust, our body, of the dust, the, in other words, our body, once the fire of the Godhead overcomes it? The distribution of the pure mysteries makes those who partake worthily to be similar by grace and by participation to him who is the causal good. Motivated by love, God has given us the mystery of Holy Communion in order for us to be deified. <clears throat> Christ sacrificed himself on our behalf through his death on the cross, and he continually offers himself up, giving his immaculate body to us daily as a soul-nourishing feast, so that by eating it, and by drinking his precious blood, we may, through this participation, consciously grow in spiritual stature and be refashioned in a purer form. Thus, we do not belong to ourselves, but to him who has united us to himself through this immortal union. St. Simeon, the new theologian, who stole the Lord as the Holy Communion. What is this measureless compassion of yours, O Savior? How have you accounted me worthy to become one of your members? I who am impure, a prodigal, a harlot. How have you dressed me in a garment most bright, glistering with the radiance of immortality and making all my members into light? For your body, pure and divine, is wholly radiant, wholly intermixed, and commingled ineffably with the fire of your divinity. I have been united, I know, also with your divinity, and have become your most pure body, a member shining forth, a member truly holy, a member glittering from afar and radiant and shining. This inexpressible mystery of God's union with man is described by St. John Chrysostom in one phrase, we and Christ are women. Holy communion is a foretaste of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Christ has given to us that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
Through Holy Communion, the kingdom which is to come dawns in our souls. Our departed brethren who have been saved also receive a fourth taste of the kingdom. For they too receive sanctification from Holy Communion. That which brings delight and bliss for those who are in that place, whether you call it paradise or the bosom of Abraham or the kingdom itself, is nothing other than this holy cup and this holy bread. That is why the Lord described the joy of the saints in the age to come as a supper, to show that there is nothing there greater than this holy table. And that's because they've been resurrected. Is that true? Is that, how, how do you translate that? Mm -hmm. They're all in this cup. They're all together. They're departed. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't quite understand how you get pull clean. meaning out of that. I'm going to say also receive for the truth of St. Yeah, because remember, as we said, so at the Pro School AD, at the beginning of the service, we put in particles for the living and for the reposed. And so the reposed through the, the symbol of these particles actually partakes of communion when it gets at that point. Yes, yeah, so when okay. it gets put into the, the cup. Mm -hmm. That's what he's talking about. The divine liturgy is an assembly of the children of God who are waiting for their Lord to return from the marriage banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. And then the Lord will gird himself and have them sit at table and he will come and serve them. We await him who is coming and at the same time we partake of him. We participate in the joy that is to come. So death is nothing other than our transition from this temporary life to eternal life. A transition from the table of the Eucharist to the banquet table of the kingdom. For the grace of the table is one, and one the host, and one the host who nourishes us in both worlds. That is, that of the living and that of the dead, the departed. <laughs> when all have communicated, the priest says, O oh God, save your people and your parents. The choir, God is the Lord, and he revealed himself to us. We have seen the true light. We have received the heavenly spirit. We have found the true faith, worshiping the undivided trinity, for the trinity has saved us. The deacon says to the priest, Master, exalt. The priest places the chalice on the holy table, senses it three times, saying each time, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory over all the earth. The priest facing the holy table lifts the chalice and says in a low voice, Blessed is our God. And he then turns to the people showing them the chalice and continues aloud, Always, now, and forever, and to the ages of ages. He then carries the chalice to the holy prothesis. So the prothesis is where the prosthomedia was, was done. So if you're looking at the altar, it's off to the, to the left. <clears throat> um, the choir says, Amen, 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 for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life. And then the troparium. Let our mouth be filled with your praise, O Lord, that we may sing of your glory. For you have counted us worthy to partake of your holy, divine, immortal, and life-giving mysteries. Keep us in your sanctification as we meditate on your righteousness all the day long. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Through Holy Communion, the Christian receives into himself the true light. His soul is united to Christ, the Son of Righteousness. His intellect, his noose, is wholly intermingled with God and illumined through and through by the divine light. For the person who has partaken of him, Christ becomes light and peace and joy, life, food and drink, clothing and cloak, a tabernacle, a divine dwelling, a sun that truly never sets, a star that ever shines, a lamp shining forth within the house of the soul. We have received into our souls not simply some ray of light, but the very orb of the sun. By grace, we have become sons attending upon the one unique sun. For Christ, having embraced all things with his illuminating power, gives to those who are worthy perpetual life and makes them new sons. Revealing experiences from his own life, St. Gregory from Lamas speaks of man's entry into the realm of the true light. Not only has Christ united his own divine hypostasis with human nature, his own divine person with human nature, so the divine and human nature unite in his one person, but he is constantly uniting himself also with these human hypostases. These human hypostases are us. Each one of us is a human hypostasis, a human person. So, yeah. So does this kind of support your your certain other day saying that like we're the new temple? Yeah. Like when you're talking about the end of the yeah. end of time saints and we're that new temple. Yes, we are. That's what we're constantly celebrating the banquet from the kingdom, from the future. It's already happening right now. 
That's the end is now. From the future, like his question earlier about like these people already being resurrected. Yeah. Would that also because the liturgy is in the future too? Like it's also participating in the resurrection too, and already being resurrected too. You can say that. Yeah. You can say that. Is Father Barnabas joking when he says if you don't like liturgy, you're not going to like heaven? And I say that sometimes. Okay. I think in heaven you don't. You're just so happy to be there. You yeah. <laughs> like it. <laughs> you like it. You like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the reality. Yeah, nobody knows. In reality, the divine liturgy is a step or a foretaste of heaven. Yeah. That's so, so that's that's what he's saying. If you don't like that, you're yeah. not going to like heaven. I, I would so like that with the other. But it's like it's an, it's not the thing. So the liturgy isn't the thing itself, but it's an icon yes. of the thing itself. And so the way that one particular place does the liturgy, you know, that might produce an icon that is not appealing to everybody. You know, it might be a certain style of icon that not everyone feels inclined toward. But then another one might produce a beautiful icon that really reflects what we think it's going to be like. And maybe so. You know, there's a matter of personal taste as well. So I can see it. I can see someone legitimately not enjoying, or you know, maybe not enjoying church um, because maybe it's not their style of icon. I can see that, but I, I can't know. see well, anybody like, not enjoying. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, like, yeah. Like, when like church was only going, I guess it's like. A Greek person was in Russia or something, and they didn't understand any of the language. Like that's how that icon might not be to their taste. Right. That's an aspect of that. Right. Does any of this, right? Can you give us someone take you too far off? But how does this connect to like open and closed communion, or like what would what is our what's the easiest response <laughs> to friends or people that are visiting? I think the easiest response, and it's totally true, is to say we would love for you to take Holy Communion. It's just that in our church, you have to be baptized first. We would be happy to catechize you and baptize you so that you can take communion, but it's got to be done in the proper order. We're in communion. We have to do it in communion. Like, you know, we're not. 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 Yeah. We have to be in communion with the right. yeah, yeah. Not, not just baptized yeah. first, because so the like that, you know, right. but the, the true worship. Yeah, I would say I would focus on I would focus <laughs> on we do want you. Oh you got to put the hands in front of you. Oh you're waving. I focus on the positive. It's his mouth. No hand raised here. I mean, that's a nice, yeah. that's a nice compliment. So yeah. Yeah. The funniest one time when I brought my friend Lauren, it was kind of like post-COVID. Yeah. And with the one spoon, she's like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't truly in community. But I've been by people that get very frustrated. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm like to see all the people. Well, you know, the, the joke is, uh, that you know someone dies and goes to heaven and how's this go and they and they go okay you know welcome and they take someone into this grand room and there's you know all these christians are in there celebrating having a great time and he says okay these, this is the protestant section of heaven and he goes to another room and he says this is the catholic section of heaven and they're in there having a great time making a lot of noise and then he goes, and this is the Orthodox section I had. He said, but they oh, should be quiet. They think they're the only ones in. Yes. That's what I'm saying. We don't have We know what he's given us. Exactly. Uh, the, the, the reference in the scriptures sound like our servants. When you look in Isaiah, and when you look in uh, you know, Revelation, you see the same types of things happening in those visions of heaven as you see in our church services. And, um, you know, so. 
No, I would say we're styled style. after that scriptural reference. Yeah. That's that's an excellent point because when somebody asks you, how is your service so tied to the scripture? Yeah. And I don't know how to answer that. I don't know the verses. I don't know the scripture verses per se Everything or where they fit. I know it's all there. Uh, I've actually like, got a copy of the liturgy that's broken. It's not our translation, but it's just some. Anyway, it's an English translation. It's actually broken out. And it shows you all the scriptural references to the standard parts. And it's it, about two thirds it, of the liturgy. Is that something yeah, we can, can you give me a copy of yeah, that? Can we get copies of that? Yeah. I used to have a book that had that, and I lost it. I narrowed it to some of the Chris, plastic spiral bound. I know we were starting this question, but it's like five fonts. Well, we can go get it printed. I'll just take it. I'll have a nice Yeah. Time to search around for it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah. You look through it, like, all the different verses. Uh, yeah, we we we're, we're given something from God, but then we're expected to do something with it, like the parable of the talents of what Billy said. All right, let's talk about the divine hypostasis. Not only has Christ united his own divine hypostasis with human nature, but he is constantly uniting himself also with these human hypostases. <laughs> As he mingles himself with each believer through their communion of his holy bodies, he becomes one body with us and transforms us into a temple for the Godhead as a whole, since in the body of Christ the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The whole fullness of the of the Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus Christ, knowing the most powerful. How then will he not illumine with the divine remnants of his body, which is within us, the souls of those who commune worthily, as once he illumined the bodies of the disciples who take one? The light of Christ illumines the whole person, leading him to the vision of the mysteries of God. Simple and unified, the presence of divine light gathers within itself the souls that participate in it and converts them to itself. It leads their intellect's faculty of sight to the depths of God so that they contemplate the great mysteries and become initiates in the mystic gods. The Eucharistic mystery, the mystery of the Son of Righteousness, dawned upon our world from the light of the Father. It is celebrated by the light of the world, which is Christ, and it is sanctified through the light of the Paraclete, Holy Spirit. Before the coming of Christ, the prophet David prophesied, In your light shall we see light. Now we too, after Holy Communion, have seen and discovered the Son of God is light, from the light of the Father, by the light of the Holy Spirit. And we proclaim this as a succinct and simple theology of the Holy Trinity. Light and light and light, but one light, one God. Um, yeah. What's a mystagogue? Mystagogue is uh, someone who leads, someone who performs sacred rites or leads others in sacred rites. There's other words like that. Mystagogy, yeah. Mystagogy. Mystagogy means the. Studying. Leading into the sacred rites. Oh, so this website that you yeah, Mister yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think he's doing it anymore. No, he's he was really a great stuff. Yeah, he's sprawled out to other websites now. So is that in your power to be ordained someone that leads in the no, sacred rites? Uh, yeah. Usually we would say in Christianity, but it's a term that's used in other religions as well. Anybody who leads a sacred rite, basically. <laughs> Uh, when when created man is fully illumined by the divine light, he is separated from creation and united with God. Again, the light seems to me to shine forth. Again, it is clearly seen. Again, it opens the heavens. Again, it cuts through the night. Again, it puts aside all things. Again, it is seen on its own. Again, it places me outside all visible things. And as I am in the midst of everything, it places me outside everything. Christ, the light of the world, dispels the darkness of the present age. He opens the heavens and leads us into the realm of the new age. There we see the light, which is the beauty of the age which is to come, and which endures the kingdom of God without beginning or successor. There in the kingdom, night shall be no more. They need no light of lamp or sun. There the light of Christ's countenance watches. The entire liturgy, as an image of the kingdom which is to come, is illuminated by the light of Christ. The martyr St. James of the Holy Mountain had the purity of vision to see the invisible. As the priest began to vest for the liturgy, the light of the angels shone in front of him like the light of dawn. When he began the service of preparation, four companies of angels went and stood at the four corners of the church, 
And after he finished and covered the precious gifts with the holy veils, they were covered with abundant light. For the visible veils signify the intelligible light, the spiritual light, which covers the holy gifts. When it was time for the great entrance, and the priest came out with the holy gifts, light went before him and covered all the faithful. And when the holy gifts were placed on the altar, that light surrounded them like the orb of the moon. In the middle of the luminous ring was the priest with the holy gifts, while outside of the angels stood with reverence, not daring to approach. That light does not depart from a pure priest, but becomes one with him. And a shining flame comes out of his mouth when he reads the gospel and the prayers. And when he lifts up his hands, light pours from all his fingers. And the saint continues. Do you guys see Are they that? talking about you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes. I'm not saying that. I don't mean that. I was like, is this guy talking about a personal experience here, or is this like every priest? Like, because then I start thinking, like, when we lock people out, no, we don't lock them out, but we shut the doors. And you can't come in while we're doing a procession. Right. And like that's power. I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, I I, yeah. I was I got confused as it was it's just a past experience. Yeah. It says he I, saw the he saw somewhere he said he got to see God. Well, and I think then, it's, and it's then one start experience lights coming. And I'm like I think it's one experience that he had of seeing the uncreated light, but I think what he's saying is that if we had the eyes to see if we had spiritual eyes, this is what we would see. The one yeah. that well, it's like, it's it's like, like those like peasants, peasants in the village that sort of told yeah. them, they were seeing the light surrounding the priests. And, yeah. like, yeah. and there are saints that have claimed to see this when they're in the oh, yeah. 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 I've always had a question regarding that <laughs> statement of that. Why isn't the church, other than Pascha, even in Pascha, always brightly lit when we have services? So if we're celebrating something in the resur the resurrection, so basically every liturgy that we celebrate yeah. is the resurrection, so it should be full should of light. light. Yeah. Uh, that's basically, that's the equivalence there. Resurrection equals light. light. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, there are some exceptions, like when you do an, a night vigil or something like that. But generally speaking, we want it all full of light, except for, but then in practice, because, because in people's, experience of the church the average person's experience they come on sunday sunday is an always always a resurrectional day right so they get used to the church being full of light oh, yeah. so it's off, off putting when you've come to a service that's a lenten yes. service yeah. like yes. we yes. sanctified okay. liturgy yeah. of land yes. or holy week especially you know everything should be mm -hmm. much more subdued because precisely because we haven't reached the resurrection we haven't yet. reached the resurrection okay we have a vigil next week by the way oh yeah so next friday night we have a vigil for saint catherine so it'll be it'll be nice. I like we'll start at nine p.m. and go until about midnight on Friday night. It's very really cool service. Very dark. Yeah. But what do you start. do during the vigil? It's uh, so we do vespers, orthros, and liturgy. Just so like then, okay, I'm thirty-one percent more over this year. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, before I forget, I just <laughs> well in between the meal and now I had a phone call. This uh, young lady sounds like sounded like a young lady. Uh, says she's coming to church on Sunday. Father Mike had told me about her too, and she she's blind and she has a uh, service dog. Mm -hmm. So she asked if the service dog could come in. And I said yes. So anyway, if we all can, the word. if you all can just keep an eye open for her. Just make sure they don't run around. It's the, not yeah, us. Not us. <laughs> Last week yeah. was me. Um, it's there. Uh, it's mixed up because everybody's substitute for everybody. Okay. It may be Neely's group. They were there last week. We can just need to start with me. We can just send my text. Okay. Okay. Do we, do we have a copy of uh, Brian Liturgy? We knew Dan because you know he's at the lighthouse. Yeah. <laughs> Where is he? He's in Athens. Oh. And. Uh, I wish they had a Braille liturgy book there at the lighthouse. At yeah. I'll ask. The Archdiocese that. produced one. Yeah, yeah. I'd seen there's like 70 bucks. Not so bad. Right. Yeah. So, a bit of Orthodox trivia. Does yeah. anybody know the it. only animal that is, is actually allowed in the church in general? A dog. A cat. 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 A cat.
Because they, they eat mice. Because the, cats uh, oh. <laughs> because the cats need to be exercised. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 When I first became Orthodox and we moved to Tallahassee, the Greek church there, there was this young young woman who was blind who had a service dog. And they would have, they would let her come in every week, and they they would even give the dog in the room. It was, right. wow. <laughs> it was kind of cute. I mean, I don't know canonically if that's really allowed, but it was it was sweet. It was yes, it could be a dog for an all right, anyway. Third, it is the third Sunday. It's in line, yeah. Peter Graffers, and George Dawkins. Okay. So George Dawkins might spend the dog gamble. So a better warn him. You can say the dog right. patrol. Yeah. <laughs> and the same continues. Yes. After the consecration, I saw the Lord as an infant lying on the patent, surrounded by light. And when the liturgy ended, I saw the divine infant ascending to heaven in glory and honor together with the holy angels. Having placed the holy gifts on the altar, the king sends them three times and recites the psalm verse, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory over all the earth. I, every time I read this, I think of this priest in Greece who he was trying to claim, he was, I don't know where he got this, but he was, you know, so the whole the liturgy is a uh, uh, a reenactment of Christ's life. We've talked about that, right? His ministry on earth, represented by the gospel coming in, the preaching of the gospel, then you have the crucifixion, the resurrection. And now, when it says, when we, after the communion, <clears throat> we put it on the altar, be exalted, O God, above the heavens, your glory over all the earth, we're referring to the ascension. So now we're, re we're representing the ascension in this whole kind of play that we're doing about Christ's whole life. Well, this one priest, he would, he would always say that, that at this point in the liturgy, the the but the the bread and the wine uh, go back to being bread and wine. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of us were like, "What are you talking <laughs> about? Are you about? unconsecrated?" Yeah. <laughs> so now, like, somehow, in this action, he was saying that it gets unconsecrated. We're like, oh, "What denomination?" No, he was <laughs> the converse of the good ones, right? <laughs> ah, <whoa. laughs> yeah. Hmm. Right, when you hear the words, when you hear the words be exalted, do not imagine that the prophet David is asking God to take additional glory unto himself, for he has no need of glory. Principally, it indicates the way. Yeah, principally it the right under be exalted that God above the heavens. Principally it indicates the way in which God is praised in heaven, where the holy angels exalt and glorify him. But the prophet wants God's glory to be exalted over all the earth as it is in heaven. Furthermore, when these words are said, it is as if we are saying to Christ, even though you abased yourself for our sake by the voluntary self-emptying of your incarnation and became obedient even unto death, ascend again now, Lord, to heaven, for after your ascent. You will also fill the whole earth with your glory. Every time the divine liturgy is celebrated, Christ yeah. comes down from heaven for our salvation. At this moment, he ascends to heaven once again. With the eyes of the soul, the faithful see the ascension of Christ. And like the disciples at the ascension, praise and bless God with, a great, with great joy. For the light of his glory and love remains also on earth and illuminates the world. <clears throat> so we get a glimpse of heaven. As we yep. Yeah. With the communion of the faithful, we reach the end of the Eucharistic mystery. The priests and people conclude with thanksgiving and praise. Let our mouth be filled with praise, the Lord. It is as if to say, we are not fit even to offer you a hymn worthy of the good things that you have vouchsafed to us. But we ask you to grant us this grace. How? By filling our mouths with praise. In what follows, the faithful pray that the sanctification which they have received may remain with them. And that with the help of the Lord himself, they may not betray this grace or lose this gift. Keep us in your sanctification, we who meditate on your righteousness all the day long. So, righteousness means here God's wisdom and love for mankind as these are manifested through the holy mysteries. 
Meditation on this righteousness is able to preserve the sanctification within us, where it increases our faith in God and kindles us. The deacon standing before the royal Lord says, Stand upright. Having received the divine, holy, pure, immortal, heavenly, life giving, and dread mysteries of Christ, let us worthily, let us worthily, worthily let, us, oh, let us give worthy thanks to the Lord. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Help us save us, have mercy on us, and keep us, O God, by your grace. Having asked that the whole day may be perfect, holy, peaceful, and sinless, let us entrust ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God. The priest in a low voice says the prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, lover of mankind, benefactor of our souls, that you have counted us worthy today, too, of your heavenly and immortal mysteries. Make straight our way, establish us all in the fear of you, watch over our life, and make firm our steps through the prayers and intercessions of the glorious Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary and of all your saints. You know, it seems crazy to everybody leave this church. Yeah. Like the youth and the teachers yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Well, this is important. Yeah, it's a big um, debate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know any priest who really likes likes it that they leave, but <clears throat> it's a tough situation. You don't finish the service. You don't finish the service. Yeah. You know, we have seen the light. Yeah. You know, you're, it just seems like after it's that. Not even that yeah. yeah. It seems like yeah. they would be dismissed after that. I think yeah. as much as 40%. Please go it really does, and it's it's just not yeah. right. And the, the it's it's interesting because we teach the kids to do it by by placing Sunday school then, and then we're shocked when the adults do it. Mm -hmm. Like, well, that's what they learned when they were growing yeah. up. Right? They leave. Well, why can't why can't they have Sunday school after church? You could. It's just people will complain. They post it and then let them complain. Let them complain. We do in the morning before. Yeah, it was yeah. 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 We, 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 we used to do it before the liturgy. We never went yeah. to too. I used to teach it before the study. Yeah, yeah, the church started like at 10 30. Right. Yeah. It, it was like 30 minutes. Yeah. 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 Not early. Yeah. Liturgy earlier, it's, it might be more, it yeah. could, it's possible because we could still be done by 12 at 10. I just, yeah. yeah, I just think it would oh, be, yeah. I think it would be better. I, I expect that. I mean, Sunday. we could be done with Sunday school. <laughs> right. said, you know. But I think it's better. I think it's the better than the whole literature. Yeah. Really? I, mean, well, I would prefer, you know, stay yeah. They, I wouldn't say that they have to necessarily stay for the memorials and other services. Yeah. No, no, but they have to have a couple of liturgy. Yes. Yeah. 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 Bring back the bell, Father. Bring it when it's time to go. Bring the bell, Father. Bring the bell, Father. Bring the bell, yeah, yeah, people just don't know. That, that's the point, that right there. Yeah. Yeah. They, we don't know. Oh, we got a lot of yeah. true. Yeah. Just just money. Money. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. 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 Then it's time for the OP. Let's put them in the porn. <laughs> or lock the doors to Paris Hall. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> What am I well, we quit putting the food out. Yeah. 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 We quit putting it out. What am I that fixes that people don't? You know, the deacon comes out and says this. It's always in dialogue with people. And sometimes I feel like this part is a monologue. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just said everybody has their mouth full of Antinoron or what. <laughs> yeah. but there's not a very strong Thanksgiving response from the, from you know, the people. You, well, why don't you say it all together when you come out? Say all together. I say, I say stand up. Stand up. We did that on the let us worthily give thanks to the Lord. You know, having done all this, stand, everybody stand up. Having done all this, let's give thanks to the Lord. And it's like, but you know, we think there's just been so much commotion. Yeah, I think that's this is the main thing. Other people tell me to shut up. But we need to. When we let people out for communion, yeah. when they need to come down the center aisle, yeah. receive communion, 
and go out that way. Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes. It yeah. takes too long. That's how we used to do it. No, no, no. Well, you can do it too. Well, it's 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 the same the increase is still there. You don't have to monitor it to one place. Yes. yes, they were backed up way into the north it's up the stairs. But you still got to have it. You weren't supposed to come down. You're supposed to come down and yeah, go, go, go to right. two priests, go to two priests, then exit. We're not supposed to put our bags to the chalice. The point then, we're not supposed to put our bags to the chalice. And that's what we're doing when we receive it. We're yeah. going this way. We need to go down the middle that's and exit. Okay, so another one. I'll tell Alice says so. Oh, yeah. oh, well, we have to, <laughs> to worry about that with five people. No, it was no big It's not that, you know what it is, it's when people are going out from the fights, people are coming back in to get into their rows, and it's a total it's day day day. Day. They Everybody goes down the middle, then they exit and go to their seats. They're not crisscrossing. Maybe before it's not as bad on my side is it is on my side. My side is quite reverent. No, in Greece is just chaos. So it is in Greece. Well, what the last week we should have anything else. Yes. Yeah. The whole portion, David, where it says stand upright all the way, read all that out loud. I I, I chant this. I don't. We don't use this translation. I can't tell you what I say. Oh, I got Are you saying that? Say stand up. Of course, we're saying it anyway. Stand up. I think it says stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Are you saying the wrong thing to say this with? No, you're supposed to say Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but not world. Oh, we can get you. Hallelujah. Yeah, so so so. Exactly. Get this. Let me get some of that mercy. I'll pick it up. I'll pick it up. All right. So here's the correction. I don't know where. I don't know where it's placing, but he's reading. Is let's do this for our rise, having partaken of the divine, holy, yes. pure, immortal, heavenly, life creating, and awesome image of Christ. Let us worthily give thanks yes. to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. There you go. Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good. That was good. So we need to yeah. respond. Don't worry. I'll holler. All right. Yeah. Like you said, it's the same thing, though. I think it's the same mentality. Yes. The, the, the service is over, and we don't have to pay attention anymore. Yeah. Like, how do we get people back in? Those people who are there do it fervently. Yes. And then there's something that when somebody sticks around for some reason, they're like, man, I'm missing out on something. Yeah. Not mm -hmm. just a bunch of people mm -hmm. talking or chewing on bread or whatever. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. And this, this is a parallel, too. And it's not the divine literature, but with the memorial services, eternal be their memory. Yeah. We should respond, may their memory be eternal. Yeah. And we try, but you sometimes go too fast. <laughs> I've never seen where they where people responded to that. Oh yeah, it's, we say it's something it. here. We, we say it. it. We, it. we say it. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Oh, it's trying to be there. They're going to be. All right, I have no words. Let's see. Yeah. 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 We have a lot. <laughs> this prayer of thanksgiving calls to mind the corresponding giving of thanks by the disciples at the end of the Last Supper. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So that we know that in Christ's time that they would pray before and they would sing a hymn when they were finished. Again. St. John Chrysostom observes, the final prayer of the Lord is a symbol of that prayer. The Lord gave thanks before giving the disciples his holy body and blood, that we may also give thanks. And after the offering, he again gave thanks and sang a hymn so that we might do likewise. St. John composed the following liturgical prayer of thanksgiving after Holy Communion. The saint feels unable to express in words the gratitude due to Christ, the giver of gifts. And he asks the Lord to preserve the celebrants of the faithful in an honorable and irreverent way of life and worthy of the heavenly table to the last moment of their lives. What praise or what hymn or what thanks can we give you in repayment, our God who loves mankind? For when we were condemned to death and immersed in sins, you bestowed freedom upon us and gave us a share in the immortal and heavenly delight of the holy body and blood of your Christ. Therefore, we pray you, keep us and your servants, the deacons, free from condemnation. Preserve with us the people here present in an honorable and a reverent way of life. Count us worthy until our last breath to partake of this mystical table unto sanctification of soul and body. 
that we may be accounted worthy of your heavenly kingdom with all who have been well pleasing to you. By the prayers of the all holy mm -hmm. pure Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary and of all your saints, for you are holy God and love mankind and you we give glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit now and forever and to the ages of the earth. Amen. Similarly, in the following hymn, St. Simeon, the new theologian, in spite of the heavenly gift of theology which he had received, says that he cannot find words to describe the magnitude of the benefactor of the Holy Communion and give thanks for it. Creator of all, maker and master, whom the seraphim may not approach, you do not, you do not only see and speak to me and feed me, but you have granted to me even to hold and eat your flesh in all reality and to drink your all holy blood. The mind is at a loss, the tongue enfeebled, and I find no words, my Savior, to proclaim the works of your goodness, which you have performed for me, your servant. You have united yourself with me, lover of mankind, in your measureless compassion. You have swept out the house that was all begrimed, and come in to dwell there, O Trinity, my God. And then you made me a throne of your divine Godhead, and a house of your unapproachable glory in your Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're on to the dismissal. <clears throat> the Let's prayer go. that you read right before, the what prayer, yeah. that's where you're kind of passing the baton to us saying, remember what you just did, you took the Eucharist, you yeah. need to live the Eucharist yeah. throughout the week. Yeah, and the dismissal too, is, it's interesting that the, so, actually, so here, we'll just go ahead and read it. Priest, let us go forth in peace. <clears throat> and then if you read the footnote, this is actually, the, that was how the liturgy used to end in the early centuries, was let us go forth in peace. And so it's interesting, the last, so that you see the progression, we take communion, we say we have seen the whole, we have seen the true light, and then what does the priest tell you to do? Go forth in peace, go go out to the world. Live the liturgy, and be a witness. Let us go forth in peace, yeah. choir, in the name of the Lord. Deacon, let us pray to the Lord, fire, Lord, have mercy. The priest standing in front of the icon of Christ says aloud the prayer behind the ambo. O Lord, who blessed, so what's the, the, the prayer behind the ambo is a very confusing title for this prayer because the ambo really doesn't exist anymore. The ambo used to be basically in the middle of the sole, it was a circle that was raised even further up that, that the clergy would stand on or the deacon would stand on to. Um, to it was like recite the prayers. It was like a pedestal. Yeah. Is that exactly. where like the pulpit? Like the, the, like the pulpit, yeah. yeah. But so this prayer used to take place behind that ambo. <clears throat> was this for like in the, you know, Russian bishop this thing on that round? Yes, yeah, that's, that's like a vestige. Okay. Yeah. All right, the priest standing in front of the, okay, behind the ambo. Says aloud the prayer behind the ambo. O Lord, who bless those who bless you and sanctify those who have put their trust in you. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Protect the fullness of your church. Sanctify those who love the beauty of your house. Glorify them in return by your divine power. And do not forsake us who hope in you. Give peace to your world, to your churches, to the priests, to our rulers, to the army, and to all your people. For every good gift and every perfect gift is coming from above, from you, the Father of lights. And to you we give glory, thanksgiving, and worship. To the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Are we going to read some saints' names in there? There's not a very good one. Not a good one. Not the end. That's the last one. Not here. That's not the very end. The divine liturgy is a journey whose purpose is man's encounter and union with God. The goal has now been realized. We have reached the end of our journey. We have seen the true light. We have seen the Lord transfigured on the Mount Tabor of the liturgy. We have partaken of his holy body and most pure blood. And as we venture to utter to our exalted visitor, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Our mother church reminds us that the end of the liturgical journey must become the starting point for our spiritual journey. Let us go forth in peace. We have to leave the mountain of the transfiguration in order to return to the world and tread the way of martyrdom of our lives. This journey becomes our martyria, our witness to Christ, the way and the life who has become our guest. So yeah, martyria means martyrdom really means witness. To go live the liturgy. Because when it says up there for our spiritual journey, it doesn't mean for your own spiritual journey. Right, yeah. During the divine liturgy, we, we receive Christ within us. Now we are invited to pass him on to the world to become witnesses to the life of Christ. 
We should come out of the sacred assembly as if we had descended from heaven itself, so that when our family, our friends, or our enemies see us, they will all understand the benefit we have received from the church. After Holy Communion, we go out into the world as Christ bearers and spirit bearers. Therefore, we strive to preserve the light we have received ever burning. So kind of like how we symbolically take the light at Pascha and we try to keep it burning throughout the whole year. It's the same thing that we get from every liturgy. <clears throat> then, even without words, our presence will transmit the grace we have received to the souls of our brethren who are not present at the liturgy. For the Christ-bearing believer is earth that brings forth fruit of itself. The divine liturgy began in peace, and in its course, the peace of God was given to us many times. Now that the celebrant dismisses us from the assembly, he once again petitions peace for us, saying, Go in peace. And without this peace, it is altogether impossible to say or do anything. Peace and love are at once the root and the fruit of our prayer at the liturgy. This peace and love do not simply make our prayer acceptable, but are also engendered by prayer itself and arise out of it like twin divine rays and grow and become perfected. The faithful, too, now are called to offer to the world the fruits of the liturgical assembly, its love and peace. The prayer behind the anvil calls the faithful the fullness, pleroma, that is the whole body of Christ's church. So the pleroma, yeah, it means fullness, but it's actually also the word that means the crew of a ship is, is a pleroma. So often the, in the hymns and in the prayers, it talks about the, the faithful of the church is the pleroma, is the, the crew, of, the, crew of, the, of the ship, which is Christ's church. Hmm. The church is Christ's ship journeying through this world, and all who belong to her form the complement crew of the ship. The world is like a sea on which the church, like a ship upon the deep, is buffeted by storms but not lost, for she has Christ, the skilled helmsman, with her. And at her center, like a mast, is the cross of Christ, which she carries with her as a token of victory over death. Her tillers are the two testaments, and the ropes that stretch around her are the love of Christ which binds the church together. As the wind, the spirit from heaven is present, by whom those who believe are sealed. She has also mariners on the right and on the left, assistants like the holy angels. As she crosses the stormy sea of life, the ship of the church is bound for the harbor of the kingdom of God. The church as a whole is like a great ship, transporting people from different places through foul weather, people who want to dwell in the same city, the city of the good kingdom. In this representation, the king of the city is God. The helmsman of the ship can be compared to Christ, the first mate to the bishop, the passengers to the multitude of the faithful, the depths of the sea to the world, the contrary winds to temptations, while persecutions, dangers, and afflictions of every kind can be likened to the storms. Christ has liberated, liberated us from sin and death, regenerated us through baptism, and made us the complement of his church. He is the true Ecclesiastes, who gathers into one complete whole the scattered sheep, and summons to one assembly those who have been led astray in various ways by the multifarious deceptions of the world. He makes us members of his blessed people, that we may become all one church, and one people, and one bride, under the one Ecclesiast and leader and bridegroom, as we are united and acquire the communion of the body. Father Mainman used to tell us that when we come to church and, you know, take the Holy Communion, yeah. it's, it's so that we can uh, have the strength to get through the week mm -hmm. until we come back and receive it again. Yeah. Because okay. it's our armor. You've been on it with Christ. Yeah. I mean, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. It gives you your strength to live the Christian life throughout the week. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting that, that, uh, mm -hmm. The middle paragraph on the page is from St. Clement, his epistle to James, 58 from 49 AD. So, mm. talk about early references of the yeah. early images of the church. Yeah. There's, there's a really early image of the church. What was that? What did they call it? The church of the sea. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, the church of the whole is like a great yeah. church, transporting yeah. people from different places. Da, da, da. All that's from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, you said that's 49 AD. It's first time. Number eight on the footnote. Yeah, yeah there was some people. Some of us can't read that little. Listen, <laughs> 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 yeah. Do we read? Well, what do you think? Should we stop there or read something? 
so yeah next wednesday is the day before thanksgiving so we'll meet in two weeks so maybe it'll be the last session at most two more but it might be the next uh, in two weeks it might be the 